history instructor here at Greenville Technical College. Thank you all for coming out. Students, faculty, community members, longtime supporters. Um, we really appreciate it. Tonight we will be having a series of discussions or lectures on different aspects or different parts of the timeline of the Holocaust. The way we'll do it is we'll start with Dr. Clark Britton and go individually. We also have Jordan Poss and Kelly Smith here who are also instructors at Greenville Tech in the History Department. They'll be moderating the Q&A. Um, we'll have, after the first four speak, we'll have a few minutes for questions for them. And at the end of the four of us speaking, We'll have questions for any of us. So again, thank you so much for coming. Please look at your programs. You'll see that tomorrow we have a movie here, Falcon All the Impossible, which Lori Copeland will moderate. I'm sorry, it's Wednesday, not tomorrow. This has been a long week already. Um, tomorrow we have storyboards. Or right now we have storyboards in the library that our students have done. Some of them are really, really impressive. So if you get a chance to go by the library and take a look at the storyboards, that just supports our student effort. Um, the storyboards cover the Holocaust. They also cover the Trail of Tears because we have some classes that don't cover the Holocaust. So we did a type of genocide for all the pictures. And my students learned that they don't really care much about Andrew Jackson. Uh, I don't know what your students learned, but that's what they found out. Um, so please look at the program. On Wednesday from 4.30 to 6, we have a movie. On Thursday night at Eastland Baptist Church, right across the entrance, we have Trude Heller, Mrs. Heller, Ms. Max Heller, speaking about her experience in the Holocaust. Okay. The second woman that we had that was coming, Bruce Steinfeld, who's also a survivor. Unfortunately, her husband has taken very ill, so she was unable to come. We are trying our best to get technology to work so we can Skype with her and ask her questions. Worst case scenario, we'll show a video of her giving her her uh, information or telling her story of what happened to her. So again, thank you for coming. If my students are here, you do need to take a program and attach to your essay. Do you guys require that? Okay. If you're, if you're doing this for any extra credit, you need a program to prove that you came. So just remember that. I would like to thank our sponsors Without this help, it's, this would never have happened. We have the Humanities Council of South Carolina. This program is sponsored, is, I'm sorry, it is a state program of the National Endowment for the Humanities, inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, culture, and heritage. Do we have any members of the Humanities Council here? They were extremely generous with a grant to help us do this tonight. And I actually have done um, the Out Loud program with the Humanities Council. They're wonderful people to work with. We also received a grant from South Carolina Council on the Holocaust. I believe we have a few members. Would you stand up? And say your name. She came from Columbia. And she's part of, we're extremely grateful, so please tell them how grateful we are for their help. We also have uh, to thank Anita Zucker, the Greenville Jewish Federation, anyone from the Greenville Jewish Federation here? The Temple of Israel, Beth Israel Synagogue, Greenfield's Deli, and when you leave tonight, there'll be cookies from Greenfield's on the table, so please help yourself. Aprons, etc., which the owner of that's supposed to be here with a bottle of water for me, so I don't know what happened to him. Um, a generous anonymous donor and the many individuals who supported this event with their time and or donations, and it's just been phenomenal. We'd also, I'd also like to thank John Riley, Shannon O'Brien, Lori Copeland, Lee McAbee, Wade Lee, Justin Eady, Michael Bryan, Clark Ritten, and where's missing Malcolm Munson? Oh no, there he is, I'm sorry. He, he, he came in. Elizabeth Varga and Carrie Morningstar. Carrie, where are you? These are our grant writers, and they did a phenomenal job. Tell us what to do, how to do it, how, what we could say, what we couldn't say, and they sent the grants in, and then we got the grants. Wendy Walden, Becky Mann, Dina Callahan, 
Patty Amick, and Lena Young. Is Lena here tonight? There she is. Thank you, Lena. Two nights in a row. And Nancy Stewart, two nights in a row. You guys are gluttons. Um, we'd also think to, like to thank Dr. Keith Miller, who was with us last night and sent out a wonderful email today to encourage people to come. We'd like to thank the Year of Altruism. Thank you. Now oh, there's my water. Greenville County Library, Upcountry History Museum, and not last, least of all, John Woodson from Tri-County Technical College, who's doing all the filming. Thank you, John. So again, thank you so much for coming, and if you can come to more events, we'd love to see you. One last thing is the candle in the center. We, um, Lori Copeland made this. We used this last night to represent Crystal Knock. Crystal Knock, for those of you who are not familiar, it was a night of broken glass. So if you look at it, it looks like broken glass. And it is to represent the 11 million who died at the hands of the Nazis. Thank you, Lord. Hi, um, I'm Kelly Smith. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, as part of Holocaust Remembrance Week, I'm here to introduce to you um, the first group of speakers. Uh, this evening, you'll sort of see the evolution from widespread anti-Semitism throughout uh, Europe and how it sort of escalates rather quickly throughout the 1930s and the early 1940s into the extermination of 11 million um, individuals. So the first group of speakers tonight are uh, Professor Clark Britton, who's going to be discussing the origins of anti-Semitism, uh, Professor Malcolm Munson, who's going to discuss Nietzsche and the genealogy of morals, uh, Professor Lori Copeland, who will discuss ideas of eugenics, and finally, for the first group, uh, Professor Michael Bryan, who will explore the art. Thank you, Joel. Good evening again. I'm going to take us to a distant past, to the, uh, the time that uh, begins roughly around the uh, time of what in Jewish history and culture is known as the Diaspora. If you are not familiar with that term, it basically it's a Greek word meaning dispersion, and it concerns the reality that when, the, when Jerusalem fell in 587 and was the city and temple and palace were all destroyed by the Babylonians, the Jewish leadership went into exile, went into dispersion, into diaspora. And indeed, for Judaism, it remains that way to this present time. And this meant that, among other things, Jews were now at the mercy of other cultures, other peoples, and they had to carve out a place for their own life. Now, it has been common for a very long time to locate the origins of anti-Semitism, as we understand it, within uh, the time when Christianity became dominant in the uh, Roman Empire. And there are scholars such as James Parks, more recently works in a work by John Carroll entitled Constantine Sword, and a feminist historian and theologian, Rosemary Ruther, who hold that view. And indeed, Rosemary Ruther once said that anti-Semitism was the left hand of Christology. But uh, a gentleman, a scholar named Ben Zion Netanyahu, and yes, he is the current president of the Prime Minister of Israel's father, who spent his career teaching Spanish at uh, Cornell University, says that we need to look earlier. We actually need to go back to the time of Alexander the Great, because this is when it happened. With the dispersion of, uh, when, well, when Alexander died and his kingdom, his empire, was divided between three of his generals, a uh, rather unsavory gentleman, and that's an understatement, named Antiochus Epiphanes, got control of what we would call Judah, the Romans later called Judea. And um, for various reasons that I can't get into in 10 minutes, he decided that he wanted to be, you could say, an evangelist of Greek culture. And part of being a, a proselytizer of Greek culture meant that he was going to wipe out everything else. And that would have included Judaism. And so within his agenda, 
was to um, take over Jerusalem, slaughter a hog on the altar in the second temple, forbid circumcision, forbid the study of Hebrew, and the list goes on and on. Well, this eventually breaks uh, results in the Maccabean Revolt, which you can read about in the Deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament, <coughs> called 1 and 2 Maccabees. Uh, so there was certainly something there that would have clearly been deemed as anti-Semitic. But Antiochus didn't treat the Jews any worse than he treated everybody else. You could say of him what was said about Stalin. He was an equal, equal opportunity oppressor, and he destroyed anybody and everybody who got into his way, or in his way. Uh, you also will read at this time, as the Jews become part of Greek culture, you will read about a, uh, a practice that didn't exist, but it was something created in the Gentile world called blood libels. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but among certain Greeks, it became common to believe that uh, annually or on a periodic basis uh, groups of Jews would go out and steal a Gentile, child or adult, uh, lock them up for a long period of time, fatten them up, and then slaughter them. It was all a lie. You know, it was just pure nonsense. But a Greek writer named Appian wrote amply about this. And um, we do know that in the Hellenistic world, in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, Jews were hated by Gentiles for any number of reasons. And uh, if they were written against, uh, you find speeches denouncing Jews, and uh, you even find that, uh, and this is reported both by Philo Judaeus and by Josephus both of whom are one of the major, two of the major Jewish sources that we have for that time and period. And what I'd like to do is read you two accounts from Philo of the, uh, the persecution that Jews were exposed to at that time. So excessive were the sufferings of our people that anyone who spoke of them, i.e. of Jews, as undergoing wanton violence and outrage, would simply be using words not properly applicable. Such a man would lack adequate terms to express the magnitude of cruelty so unprecedented that actions of conquerors in war, who are also merciless to their conquerors, would seem kindness in comparison. And then he says later, I have another uh, account. These, by the way, happened in 36 AD in uh, Alexandria. While still alive, they, uh, tied with thongs and nooses and binding their ankles, dragged them through the middle of the market, leaping on them and not even sparing their dead bodies. For more brutal and savage than fierce wild beasts, they severed, they severed them limb from limb and piece from piece, and trampling on them destroyed every liniment so that not even the last remnant was left which could be or which could receive burial. Now, I am not going to suggest that Christianity does not pick up on these practices and continue. It certainly did. And uh, speaking as someone who is a Christian, I am embarrassed and ashamed about it, even though it was centuries ago. But nonetheless, um, I think it's important to understand that this was something that was prior to the rise of Christianity in the Roman Empire, and that obviously, as we look at the events we're primarily talking about today, it continues beyond it. And if we look at medieval accounts, we will also see the pogroms on Jews. They were attacked by, during the Crusades in 1338 in the Alsace. Uh, there are accounts of men, women, and children being bound together and burned in caves, of uh, women and children being driven into caves where fires had already been lit. And in fact, in Stras Strasbourg, 2,000 Jews were murdered in that way. Or as Rabbi Wilson said from last night, they perished because they were blamed for the plagues. And you can find uh, a virulent anti-Semitism in many 
uh, Christian theologians' writings. I do want to make one case for one who might qualify as a sort of Gentile just, and that was St. Augustine. Augustine said that Jews were here because of, the, because of the purpose of God in history. We should respect them and we should allow them to live. And I think that's an important, uh, an important point to make because uh, Augustine remains to this day an important figure for Christian theology. And I believe on that my time has just about expired, so I thank you. Good evening. I'm Malcolm Bunsen. I'm a professor of philosophy here at Greenville Tech. The title to my uh, remarks tonight is Changed, so um, appropriate title would be Hitler, Nazism, and Nietzsche's Dangerous Ideas. Before I begin my presentation, I want to issue a disclaimer as follows. My remarks here on the interpretation of Nietzsche's philosophy are strictly that, an interpretation, and not to be taken as a final word on this complex and nuanced philosopher. In other words, there are other books to which I could refer anyone who would like to follow up with a closer look at this important thinker for our time. <coughs> so now I want to talk about the damages done by the Germany of Hitler and Nazism. But the damages I want to discuss very briefly, I'm afraid, are those that have to do with the reception and understanding of certain philosophical ideas. Not historical damages as such, such as the Holocaust itself, and the apparent immorality of its concrete effects. My main point will be not that the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche supported, even influenced, those of Hitler and the Nazi party, but rather the converse, that certain ideas at the heart of Nazism greatly influenced, in other words, distorted the reception and understanding of Nietzsche's ideas particularly in the English-speaking world, where reliable translations of his works languished for three to four generations following his death in 1900. I hope you will find this point important in understanding the very far-reaching effects of historical events like the Holocaust, which not only have certain concrete um, outcomes during the same time period, but can influence what is taken to be true for generations. Given time restraints, I cannot fully introduce Nietzsche's philosophy, which was developed during the years 1869 to 1899, but will simply point to some of his controversial ideas and refer anyone interested in his thought to treatments of his life and work by Walter Kaufman and R.J. Hollingdon. Nietzsche's philosophy most famously deals with what he calls the death of God and certain ideas related to this. First, nihilism, or the total absence of all value in the world. Second, what he calls master morality versus slave morality a largely historical understanding of ethics. Third, perspectivism, the idea that there is finally no objective truth. Um, fourth, the superman, or better, overman, the figure Nietzsche points to as his best solution to the problems deriving from the death of God. And finally, fifth, the will to power, Nietzsche's idea of the organizing principle at work in the world of both human and cosmic affairs. 
yet often in a quite paradoxical way, Nietzsche refers to as self-overcoming. As I've said, these are only a sample of Nietzsche's ideas, but they can serve to appreciate both what he is saying and how he stands in relation to his thought. What Nietzsche said was the goddess dead. And so now humanity will have to deal with that cultural fact. Immediately upon this, one has to deal with the question of whether Nietzsche was advocating the death of God or rather disclosing a cultural phenomenon that he predicted will only grow in its evidence. Well, he is decidedly doing the latter and is warning us of the necessary implications of God's demise. First, the threat of nihilism, the absence of any objective point from which to view truth and the possibility of values based on, based not on good versus evil, but on what he terms good versus bad. The only ideas from those that I've mentioned that he really advocates in any way is the overman, but he offers only very speculative and incomplete ideas regarding what a such a being would be like. So, I'm saying that the beginning point for understanding Nietzsche is that he is revealing a dire situation and warning of the threat of nihilism and loss of objectivity. Beyond this warning, Nietzsche is indicating what he sees as the correct way to understand the world through the concept of will to power and what he thinks must happen if nihilism is to be overcome the future occurrence of some one or more than one to create new ideas in the absence of the old ones based on God and good versus evil. <clears throat> now, what is the misunderstanding of these ideas and how did Nazi Germany contribute to this? Well, basically, this misunderstanding derives from thinking that Nietzsche advocates what he only announces. The death of God and the consequent threat of nihilism and loss of truth are frightening ideas that Nietzsche only points to because of their threat to humanity. The reason Nietzsche's ideas have been largely garbled, particularly, as I said, in the English-speaking West, is that his philosophy, excuse me, his philosophy was initially interpreted through the medium of Nazi ideology. I want to briefly indicate the interesting story of how this misinterpretation occurred below. But first, I want to point out the obvious distortion of Nietzsche's ideas when seen through Nazism. Misunderstood as an ally and ideological supporter of the Third Reich, Nietzsche becomes the advocate of the unholy and its utter lack of morality anti-Semitism and nationalistic aspirations to dominate the world through a thorough distortion of his central concept of the will to power as some physical, in other words, political domination of the world. Nietzsche's introduction to non-Germans and also to a great extent to the Germans themselves came in this form and thus he was roundly criticized and dismissed as venturing on lunacy. When you add in the fact that he indeed suffered a completely devastating emotional breakdown before he died, you have filled out the picture of him as bizarre and dangerous. Finally, how did Nietzsche come to be seen as a Nazi sympathizer and anti-Semite Advocating, advocating the domination of the world through an utterly immoral, nihilistic view of humanity. Briefly put, the most important thing to understand is that once Nietzsche was no longer able to see to his own affairs because of his emotional breakdown, his only sibling, his sister, Elizabeth Furster Nietzsche, took over his literary estate. Elizabeth 
undoubtedly loved and even idolized her talented brother. But she neither could understand the subtlety of his thought, nor could manage his remaining papers without construing them through Nazi ideology. After all, her husband, Bernard Furster, who was dead from suicide by the time that Elizabeth came to have control of Nietzsche's papers, was such a sworn advocate of anti-Semitism that he had founded a Teutonic anti-Semitic colony in Paraguay called Nuevo Germania. Elizabeth wanted her brother's thought to succeed in Germany. Thus, she sought to ingratiate herself with the political elements of nationalism and anti-Semitism, which her brother specifically repudiated in his writings. This led her to promote Nietzsche as proclaiming a completely false interpretation of the will to power, actually published a whole stale travesty of his remaining papers under the title of the will to power, and eventually succeeded in attracting Hitler himself to the Nietzsche archive, which he had set up after Nietzsche's incapacitation. Once the picture became broadcast of Hitler adulating Nietzsche, and Nazi sympathizers, Alfred Baumler and Richard Erler, were brought in to translate and propagate Nietzsche's thought, the distortion of a great thinker's legacy was a fate accompli. Thank you. Good evening. In continuing our examination of the evolution of the Holocaust, I will, brief, I will briefly discuss the development of the concept of eugenics and the role that it played in the mass murder of millions. Eugenics, by definition, is the study, belief, of improving the human condition and population by discouraging the reproduction of undesirable traits, allowing only for the most socially acceptable those individuals who espouse the desired characteristics of a given ethnic and racially defined population to reproduce. Eugenics in its most basic definition means good generation, good origin. Although the concept was introduced in the early 1880s to solidify the rationale of imperial nations in bringing stability and order, civilizing, if you will, what Rutger Kipling referred to as the savage peoples, Eugenics, however, is not merely the byproduct of modern imperialism, and in fact, traces its ancestry to militant cultures like ancient Sparta, where infanticide was commonly used to ensure that only the strongest of Spartan children survived into adulthood. The fundamental principle behind the philosophy of eugenics was to create a controlled, utopic, homogeneous society Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin in 1883, advocated for selective breeding in the human population, and he argued with great success, I might add, the natural selection in humans had been thwarted by the rise of civilization, and thus allowed the in less intelligent individuals that were lacking in hereditary talent and character to survive and reproduce. At the same time that Galton was formulating his ideas regarding eugenics, British philosopher Herbert Spencer published his own spin on the topic, advocating what he would term to be the survival of the fittest. When the human population had been systematically dwindled down until only the fittest survived, only then could we, as a species, be prosperous. It was Spencer, not Darwin, coined the term survival of the fittest. Galton and Spencer's ideas were merged by the intellectual community, by the upper crust of society, who sought to undermine the growing influence in what anthropologist William B. Ripley in his book The Races of Europe, published in 1899, referred to as the sub-races and sub-sub-races of peoples. The interest stimulated the birth of social Darwinism. Due to their belief that all human life was in a constant struggle for existence, 
social Darwinists advocated that only through competition between the classes, races, and ethnicities could inferior peoples be weeded out. In the early 1900s, capitalizing upon the popularity of the social Darwinist movement in the United States as well as Western Europe, Alfred Plotz, the founder of the German eugenics movement, argued that genetically, in genetically inferior should not be allowed to live at the expense of those who were stronger. He called for them to be relieved of their meager existence that, so that society would not suffer the burden of caring for them. Following in Plot's footsteps in 1920, Hoche and Binding, a physician and attorney respectively, published their seminal work, a work for destroying the lives not worth living. They advocated that Germany should not help the disabled and the unfit to survive when so many German youths had died during World War I. In their definition of who was worthy, biological determination played a serious role in who would be deemed inferior. Building upon the rise of the social Dar German social Darwinist trend, in 1919, Adolf Hitler wrote an anti-Semitic essay in which he advocated for the legal opposition and removal of the Jews. When he published Mein Kampf in 1925, he rationalized in his argument that Jewish inferiority was in, in that Jewish inferiority in that Jews were inherently evil and wanted world domination. Upon his appointment as Chancellor in 1933, he was able to finally put his own ideas regarding genetic hierarchy into practice. Stemming from Hitler's own personal eugenic philosophy, Nazi anti-Semitism was not therefore based solely on religious ideology, but rather added an entirely new dimension, race. Jews were a subhuman population and that status could not be resolved through religious conversion, medical expulsion, or forced removal. Only through their systematic annihilation, the Nazis argued, could the problem be solved. Within a very short span of time after Hitler came to power, German miscegenation laws were codified. Interracial marriages were deemed to be racial defilement of pure German blood and outlawed. Those who violated the law were publicly humiliated and punished. Systematic legislation diminishing the legal status of Jews inside Germany quickly followed. The 1933 law for the prevention of hereditary disease offspring and the 1934 law for the simplification of the health system called for parents to deliver their children to clinics so that they could be evaluated with regard to racial purity and genetic, superior genetic traits. The Nazi desire to populate Germany with pure Aryan blood led to the passage of the 1935 Nuremberg Laws which set the precedent across Germany for anti-Jewish legislation. As a result of the Nuremberg Laws, racially pure German couples who desired to have children were given legal and tax benefits and encouraged to procreate at a rapid rate. In giving German couples incentives to reproduce ethnically acceptable children, Hitler conceptualized that only through this form of racial hygiene would Germany once again emerge as a powerful nation. It would do so through the strength of the Aryan people. In order to ensure an ethnically pure German society, Hitler approved the creation of the T4 program, in which thousands of people who were deemed to be weak and racially impure were neutralized, killed, in facilities like the Hadamar Clinic, mobile gas buses, work, concentration, and death camps. Through leg though legislation le that limited the rights of those individuals deemed to be subversive and subhuman, as well as the implementation of programs like T4, the Nazi ideology of purifying Germany rapidly evolved into what we know as the final solution. <coughs> As the beginning of World War II drove the need for hospital beds to accommodate thousands of German, wounded German soldiers, those who were deemed to have been living lives not worth living were relocated to euthanasia in concentration camps. The final solution 
the complete and total annihilation of Europe's Jewry and those deemed racially and ethnically inferior, including the Slavic peoples, peoples of mixed ancestry, gypsies, people of color, the mentally handicapped, religious deviants, Jehovah Witnesses, evangelical Christians, became the penultimate driving force behind Nazi eugenics ideology. The United States Holocaust Museum now estimates that between 15 and 20 million people were imprisoned during the Holocaust. And of those, 11 million, including 1 million children, perished. I wish I could say that this was the last time that significant numbers of human beings were murdered in mass due to extreme nationalism and the idea of racial superiority, but unfortunately I cannot. In recent years, the genocides in the former Yugoslavia, the Congo, and Sierra Leone give us clear indication that we still have not learned many lessons from the past. Thank you. jobs 
in the theater, in the film industry, and in visual arts. But even the extraction of Jews from the German and economic cultural life was not enough for many within the Nazi party. There were hardline anti-Semites within that talked of taking even tougher action against the Jews across the board, with or without the backing of Hitler and his government. Uh, it, it, it may seem inconceivable that there were some Nazis that felt that at this point Hitler had been too soft on the Jewish question, but there were those that were extremely uh, hardline within the organization. It was in 1935 an escalation in spontaneous violence against Jewish people and property, conducted chiefly or primarily by the Brown Shirts, the SA, the Sturmabteilung, known as the uh, the stormtroopers. These were the thugs that were the enforcers for the Nazi party. It was August of 1935 that Hitler had ordered to stop to these individual actions, not to protect Jews, but essentially to prevent disruption or damage to the German economy, the destruction of their property and their businesses. At the Nazis' annual rally in September of 1935, Adolf Hitler was under considerable pressure from those within the party to uh, bring about more direct responses to the Jewish question. And there were calls for sweeping laws to restrict Jewish economic influence, to try and prohibit interracial marriage, sexual relations, uh, even to limit or remove the citizenship of Jews living in Germany. And some Nazis demanded that the government issue uh, clear legal and ethnological guidelines to determine who was Jewish and to what degree. At the Nazi Party's seventh annual rally, dubbed the so-called Rally of Freedom, beginning in Nuremberg on September 10th of 1935, during the course of this rally, Hitler summoned many of his uh, fellow officials within the Nazi Party, ordering them to put together a draft of anti-Jewish laws for presentation to the German Reichstag. Hitler himself spent uh, considerable time trying to come up with adequate uh, racial and legal definitions for what encompassed a Jew within German society. He was unable to make up his mind, which uh, some scholars say was not uh, an unusual situation with uh, the Fuhrer. So he left this matter ultimately to his officials to determine uh, who was Jewish and what made them Jewish. On September 15th, Hitler addressed the Reichstag and temporarily uh, convened at that point in Nuremberg, announcing two new laws to clarify and define the racial identity of Jews in Germany. The law for the protection of German blood and German honor. This was the first piece of legislation that defined a full-blooded Jew, or Juden, as a person with either three or four Jewish grandparents. A full-blooded German was anyone with four German grandparents. Those who did not fit into either of these categories uh, were categorized as Mishlinga, or a mongrel, kind of a mutt in terms of their ethnicity. Um, neither fully Jewish nor fully Aryan German. Once this law was passed, uh, the Nazi propaganda wing picked up the ball and, and ran with it, creating and releasing infographic charts such as we see here that were used to educate the public about the ethnic composition uh, and the restrictions. And this was part of a widespread mass propaganda effort by the Nazi party. Um, this law also prohibited marriage or extramarital uh, sexual relations between Jews and Aryans and even German women of Aryan extraction who were under the age of 45 were forbidden from working in Jewish households as maids and domestic servants. The Reich citizenship law. Um, under the terms of this law, only those of pure Aryan blood were granted automatic citizenship. Jews were deemed to be state subjects and their fate determined by government policy. State subjects, not citizens. This reform effectively abolished the citizenship of Jews within the German Reich. They were no longer permitted to vote, hold public office, 
while Jews already working for the government were to be retired at the end of 1935. Uh, Michelinga would retain their citizenship provided they converted from Judaism and became practicing Christians. These two laws essentially uh, became known as the Nuremberg Laws. They were well received at the Nuremberg <coughs> Rally, but even they didn't satisfy the extremists within the party or within the, uh, the SA. I believe that Hitler just hadn't gone quite far enough with this. Uh, between the mid-30s and into the first years of the Second World War in the early 1940s, the Nazi regime passed a slew of laws, decrees, and regulations that further eroded Jewish civil rights. More than 2,000 anti-Semitic decrees were passed at the national level, the state level, or even as far down as municipal levels. Some of these seemingly minor, but others affecting huge numbers of people. Um, Jews no longer permitted to serve as officers in the German military, passed in 1935, banned from working as tax, uh, tax advisors, from working as veterinarians, teachers, municipal authorities, uh, prohibited from owning gun stores, adding the, uh, the name Israel or Sarah to their given names, wearing signs and symbols that identify them as Jews, and it goes on and on and on throughout this. In 1938, the government also launched a uh, concerted effort to eliminate Jews from German economic life. Between 1933 and 1938, Jewish-owned businesses endured significant pressure that was aimed at basically forcing them to either close down or sell off to Aryan Germans. Um, in addition, Nazi law prohibited Jews from certain occupations and from 1938 on prohibited Jews from working alongside Aryans. Basically, in 1938, the Nazi regime moved to completely remove Jews from the economic life of Germany and to Aryanize, or basically transfer all Jewish property into the hands of Aryan Germans. And this was all done under the guise of legality, stability, and order. Take some questions if you have for the four speakers. Oh, come on. You don't know it all. <laughs> Why were these laws called the Nuremberg Laws? Why were these laws called the Nuremberg Laws? <laughs> they, were, they were referred to that. Uh, as a result of having been introduced at the Nuremberg rally uh, with the Nazi party, and as a result, and as a result, the, uh, the, the the two distinct laws then were associated with that. But it was just mainly uh, as regarding the, the Nazi rally. How long did it take to draft the Nuremberg Laws? To draft the ones that I was just uh, describing uh, was, was a relatively short duration. I, I'm not sure in terms of actual like, numbers of days. Uh, I believe it was done within the course of uh, less than several months though, that they put this together. This was really, to a certain degree, um, knee-jerk on the part of Hitler and some of the higher staff of the government. In the back. Uh, was there anyone opposed to these laws you know, other than Jewish people? Was there anyone opposed to these laws other than Jewish people? Yeah, there were voices of dissent. There were definitely those that were that were not uh, in favor of this. But I think we should also uh, understand at the time the the prevailing mood in Germany at that time was increasingly moving towards an anti-Semitic. Uh, position already, and it was also very dangerous to be uh, a dissenter against the, uh, at that time, prevailing Nazi uh, hierarchy. That if you were the voice of opposition, uh, it wasn't unusual that uh, there could be a knock at the door late in the evening and your friends wouldn't see you. Again. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a Jewish American. Uh, 
Yes. Um, was there anything in the German Constitution that um, basically um, opposed the, the Nuremberg laws? Did they just disregard that? Or Did you say Constitution? Yes. Was there anything in the German Constitution that opposed the Nuremberg laws? <laughs> I can't answer that with any degree of certainty. Um, what I do know from having uh, done some of the, the reading and preparing is that certainly many of the uh, the laws and and the ideas of the Weimar Republic that had been in place before the, the Nazis had seized power, uh, they pretty much disregarded and held most of that with disdain. So that whether there would have been a constitutional uh, objection to anything that was happening at the time, ultimately Hitler would have given that pretty short shrift. And I, I'd like to add that it probably didn't matter a whole lot because of the express powers given to, to uh, Hitler at the time in 33 that you know any of those laws would have been nullified or at least marginalized so that it could go through. So it, it wouldn't have mattered even if there were laws because it wasn't going to go through. He had the power to do this and to move through legally to move through these laws as they saw fit, hence why they would have so many so quickly. The Enabling Act. The Enabling Act would allow him to pass any law he wanted. Yes. Do you, is it possible that the, the appearance, I guess not just the appearance, as so much decisiveness, the decisiveness of the aggressive speed of these laws were one of the things that made them attractive to German people after such uncertainty? Is it possible that the aggressive speed of the passage of the laws? Yeah, I think that uh, I think there's there's something very relevant in that. That the, the Nazis, part of their appeal was the, um, bringing order, bringing stability, bringing decisiveness, bringing back honor to the, the fatherland. That was a part of the appeal to many Germans. This was a part of the you know, the image that was portrayed, that was put forward. That, you know, we've got things under control. We've got a plan. Quick, efficient, um, even with opposition, we still things would be And one thing that the uh, Nazi did to gain power was betray the office he had failed. That it was just a bunch of doddering old men arguing with one another to get us to get some power. So, uh, so, Was this the largest movement of anti-Semitism? Clark, can you address that? Uh, with this degree of technology, it's aimed at just aimed at basically getting rid of the people who were Would you use a microphone because of filming? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, basically, it was the first time that this many people had been rounded up with the sole purpose of being destroyed. A group of people, actually 11 million or more, who were deemed or defined as marginal. And thus, you, uh, and what makes it different than, say, uh, Stalin or the Armenian genocide in Turkey uh, around the time of World War I was the fact that technology was used, industry was used, all coordinated together towards this one goal, which was to exterminate these people. And that gives it, it that's what makes it unusual. Uh, you know, the Quran's I read about earlier, you know, you know, nobody was that organized, nobody had that much technology. And incidentally, a number of the corporations that were involved in those things are still thriving today. Yes. In the black t-shirt. Um, was there anything uh, to show that Charles Darwin supported his cousin's ideas? <coughs> Lauren, was there anything to show that Charles Darwin supported his cousin's ideas? Darwin and microphone. Uh, Darwin and Galton communicated a lot, um, but Darwin 
Darwin's ideas, we need to remember that when Charles Darwin wrote them, it was more of a theoretical approach. It was a new idea about um, this, about evolution, evolution as a whole. So when Galton begins to apply it to human beings, Dalton or Darwin does have an issue with it in the very beginning. Uh, and then after Spencer coins the term fit, survival of the fittest, of course, which we all apply to Charles Darwin's work, and in fact it wasn't Darwin's work, um, Darwin begins to have a serious problem with it. He really feels like that, he, that, that it, the idea of social Darwinism, number one, taking his name, he had a problem with it. And then number two, um, we had gone too far with this whole idea of promoting his idea of the evolution of the hierarchy of the species and saying that now we're going to apply it to human and only the, the, the most eloquent, the best out there should be allowed to survive. The rest of human beings who are deemed to be inferior should be exterminated. And Darwin had a problem with that. He saw that as being, uh, as essentially corrupting his work. Did that answer your question? Yes. What role, if any, did organized religion play what role, if any, did organized religion? What was the rest of it? I think I can answer that. And it's messy and it's complicated. Clark, can you repeat the question? Uh, what role did organized religion play in the rise of uh, uh, Nazism in Germany? It's complicated, it's messy. There was something called the Confessing Church. And a number of uh, theolo Protestant theologians joined that as a reaction or rejection of the National Socialist Party. There were numerous Catholics who rejected it as well. Uh, and also, we do know that Hitler had every intention of going after the Catholics as soon as he had got rid of the Jews. Uh, Pius XII's predecessor had issued a statement of uh, condemning National Socialism. And Pius XII, who plays like the deputy and others, gets blamed for possibly a lot more than he was responsible for. He might could have done more, but if you look at it, you wonder what, because he felt that he had to protect the Catholics as best he could. And I'm not saying that what he did there was necessarily but I think to believe that he will the death, or to suggest that he will the death of 11 million people, uh, probably couldn't be supported. So you find some religious people who supported it, but Hitler's program, I mean, despite what uh, a number of people said very recently, Hitler's uh, agenda was essentially a kind of
think in order to understand the appeal of Nazism when it comes when it finally breaks out, is do we need to go back and revisit the end of World War One? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure. And yeah, the treaty, the terms of the Treaty of Versailles really kind of set this this course of action, kind of set it all into motion. Under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, Germany had to disarm. It had to completely stand down its army and its stand down its war production capabilities. And it was assessed, I think, gentlemen, <coughs> ladies, if you help me remember, $300 million in war reparations payments yeah, to the original allies, which did not include the United States. To make matters even more compli uh, complicated, uh, Germany's industrial sector had been completely demolished during the First World War. So its industrial cap making capability um, was non-existent. Inflation skyrocketed, the, the German currency plummeted, and Germans, after the terms of the Treaty of Versailles was signed, actually were starving to death. Things were economically in the country were extraordinarily <coughs> bad. And they were looking for someone to blame. They were looking for someone to lay the blame on what happened to them in World War I. And so the most culpable population that they could find, the easiest population that they began to find, were people who were actually being prosperous and still prosperous after the end of World War I. And that was the, the Jews. And it I think it, it, it builds a very complicated scenario when we're, when we're looking at this because the United States played an important role in this as well. Um, under the, because the war reparations were so large from the, the Germans to be paid back to the original allies, which did not include the United States, American bankers were loaning Germany money to pay their war reparations debts. American bankers would loan money, the Germans would keep part of that money and pay part of the loans to the original allies. The original allies would turn and then make payments back to the United States. Of course, the American banking sector was earning a profit off of that. When the American banking sector collapsed in 1929 and the world was plummeted into the Great Depression, it stands to reason at the moment the American economy collapsed, so did Germans. And that is, it is at that point that Hitler and his... I don't want to give him any more credit than credit is due, but he was a very powerful speaker. And in order for a population to be swayed, you only need three elements for a revolution to emerge. You need people to be starving. You need for them to be desperate. And you need for them to have an unwielding, un, un, just unreproachable leadership. Someone who can convince them that everything will be okay if they just blindly follow them. And people, when people are threatened with that, as we've seen throughout history, people will latch on to that and they will begin to follow that philosophy. Even though they might find a problem with it themselves, they will dogmatically follow it because whenever they're personally threatened themselves, you go to into self-preservation mode. And if someone promises you the moon, if someone promises you that it's going to be okay, you will dogmatically follow it, and that's what happens. There were so many people, Germans, who were starving to death, and the things were situations by Germany was so bad, but with the human aspect on it, it, it stands within reason why they would blindly begin to follow Hitler and the Nazi ideology. of the final solution began with the euthanasia program. A phrase that Nazis used often was life unworthy of life. Clearly they believed they had the right and the vision to determine who should live and who should die. Foreshadowing the final solution was the euthanasia program. 
a secret program which eventually became a well-known open secret, was their plan and process to kill the mentally and physically deficient and damaged citizens of their own country, including the elderly. This program predated the final solution by two years. This was an effort to restore the racial integrity of the German nation. Hitler's ultimate goal was the purity of the German race. He heinously supported the belief that only the healthy and the capable of work should be allowed to live. Pursuing his goal, his first mass killing was against those with severe psychiatric, neurological, or physical disabilities who represented a genetic and financial burden upon Germany, society, the German society and the state. He killed the infirm, regardless of age or social connection. The beginning of this program was the killing of disabled children. In October of 1939, parents of young children with disabilities were encouraged to bring their children to special pediatric clinics, which in actuality were killing units. This was done by lethal overdoses of medication or starvation. This grew from infants to juveniles of 17 years of age. A transcript from an oral history with Robert Bogman, born in 1937, is as follows. My mom and I were summoned to a part of the university clinic in Heidelberg, in Schlerheim, and there I was examined. And during the examination, my mom was sitting on the outside of the room, and she overheard a conversation that the doctors would do away with me, would abspritz me, which means they would give me a needle and put me to sleep. My mom overheard the conversation, and during lunchtime, while the doctors were gone, she grabbed hold of me. We went down to the Nekar River, into the high reeds, and there she put my clothes on. And from there on, we really went into hiding, because now we knew that they really were after us. So we went to my father's father's house, where we stayed until I started school. The Reich's ministry circulated a decree requiring doctors and nurses to abide by the decisions of the euthanasia program. Different means of killing were utilized in this program. In the beginning, patients were smothered. Letters of disease claiming pneumonia or other communicable diseases were mailed to the families, often weeks or months later. One of the ways in which the public became aware was when two families would compare their letters. Some patients were allowed to starve to death. This happened with Hitler's approval into 1942, when by that time the Nazis had broadened their net to include geriatric patients. What service could the elderly provide to the German country that would benefit, uh, financially benefit the fatherland? The Nazis considered them useless. Any doctor who delivered a less than perfect infant was legally bound to report the delivery and the abnormalities to the German government. From that point, the parents were bombarded with requests to bring the child to a facility. This gradually grew to include children to the age of 17. Scholars estimate that approximately 5,000 children were killed. The program worked so well for the Nazis that it was extended to include people of all ages. Gradually, the noose enlarged to include the, the elderly. Hitler signed a secret authorization in order to protect participating physicians, medical staff, and administrators for prosecution. This author authorization was backdated to September 1st, 1939, a habit that the Nazis had, to suggest that the effort was related to wartime measures. Utilizing a practice developed for the child euthanasia program, <coughs> T4 planners began in the autumn of 1939 to distribute carefully formulated questionnaires to all public health officials, public and private hospitals, mental institutions, and nursing homes for the chronically ill and aged. The form's sinister purpose was suggested only by the emphasis which the questionnaire placed upon the patient's capacity to work, and by the categories of patients which the inquiry required health authorities to identify, those suffering from schizophrenia, epilepsy, dementia, encephalitis, and other chronic psychiatric or neurological disorders, those not of German or related blood, the criminally insane are those committed on criminal grounds and those who've been confined to the institution in question for more than five years. Secretly recruited medical experts, physicians, many of them significant, of significant reputation, 
worked in teams of three to evaluate the form. <coughs> On the basis of their decisions beginning in January 1940, T4 functionaries began to remove patients selected for the euthanasia program from their home institutions and to transport them by bus or by rail to one of the central gassing installation, installations for killing. Along with the deaths of the patient, the Nazis established a killing machine that enabled them to pursue the extermination of the Jews. This included people willing and able to kill and the eventual Zykon B gas that would speed up and cheapen the cost of exterminating the Jews. The program was referred to, to as the T4 program, taking its name from the street address from which it operated in Berlin. Six gassing locations were created in Germany for adults. Prior to the gassing stations, the Germans experimented with gas vans in which people would be placed and then killed with carbon monoxide. This proved difficult, and sometimes people wouldn't die. Also, when opening the doors of a van, of a van the bodies would fall out on those required to dispose of them. This also occurred in the attempts to kill the Jews with carbon monoxide. Beginning in 1940, the patients were gassed in pretend showers, again with the use of carbon monoxide, and then burned in a crematorium. The pieces of the puzzle for the final solution were falling into place. The families or guardians received an urn, along with a bogus reason for the death. Hitler ordered a halt to the program in August 1941. At this point, well over 70,000 German citizens had been murdered. This, of course, was not a true ending. The program moved further underground, and the killings continued well into the last days of World War II and ended with well over 200,000 dead. The euthanasia program was initially instituted in the German lands of Germany, Austria, Alsace, Lorraine, and parts of Poland. As the Germans took over other lands, including Russia and larger portions of Poland, the SS was incorporated in shooting the patients. Over 30,000 were killed in this manner by August 1941. The use of the SS and the Wehrmacht precluded the ideological ideas used in the T4 killings. Much of what the SS and the German army did was get rid of people in hospitals, which they then took, up, took over as possessions for barracks. The euthanasia program was a rehearsal for much of what was to come in regards to the final solution, which included the murders of gypsies, homosexuals, Africans, and many others. This was the Nazi idea of a pure race, one which did not include anyone other than those of Aryan ancestry. And I would like to take a moment, if you'll look at the beginning of your program, you'll see the list of the people that uh, Hitler targeted the 11 million. Thank you. Soviet Union. 
And this changes a lot from the perspective of the Nazis. The idea here now is that large chunks of territory containing large Jewish populations are now going to fall under Nazi control. If you look at places like Poland, the Ukraine, and parts of the Soviet Union, that is the epicenter of the Jewish population in Europe. This is a cause of concern for the Nazis. Not only is it a threat to their ideals about racial purity, but the Nazis also <laughs> believed that the Jews were responsible for their defeat in World War I. Nazis believed that the Jews had stabbed them in the back and caused them to lose the war. They don't want to see a repeat of that going into World War II, so it's in the run-up to the invasion of the Soviet Union that we're going to see high-ranking Nazi officials gather together and make the decision to begin the mass extermination of the Jews. We're going beyond attempts to strip them of their citizenship rights and entering into an entirely new phase. But calling for the murder of millions of people and actually developing a plan to put that into action is something entirely different. And so ultimately, the job is going to be handed over to the SS under the leadership of Heinrich Himmler, obviously one of the most guys we encountered in history here. And Himmler, in turn, is going to turn the task over to one of his important followers there, Reinhard Heydrich. So it's the SS and Heydrich who are going to be responsible for coming up with a plan to basically murder the Jews of Eastern Europe. And the way the plan was designed to work is Heydrich and the SS are going to put together these noble mass killing squads that are known as the Einsatzgruppe. There's four of these units in total. Initially, they were only composed of about 3,000 individuals. Most of them were SS soldiers, but they also included some ordinary German citizens transferred from things like police battalions. And the idea was that these Einsatzgruppe units would move in behind that initial military advance. As Nazi troops were pouring into places like Eastern Poland or the Soviet Union, the Einsatzgruppen units would move in behind. And they would essentially fan out across places like Poland and the Soviet Union and the Ukraine. They'd go into these towns and cities, they'd round up the Jewish population and murder them. And so when we see that Nazi invasion begin in the summer, of 1941. These group and units go into action almost immediately. The killings begin three days after the invasion of the Soviet Union begins. And in the first phase of the killings, these Einsatzgruppe and units were encouraged to focus their attention on Jewish men and older boys. The basic idea here is that if we focus on killing the males, the older individuals, then the soldiers can acclimate to that process, they can get used to killing. Later on down the line, we can expand operations. And so essentially the major means of execution was these onsets group and units would go into one of these particular towns or cities, they would round up the local Jewish population, the, uh, the males, and they were usually assisted by members of the local community. Got to remember that anti-Semitism was strong in places like Eastern Europe. A lot of these places had been under Soviet control, and a lot of them saw the Nazis as liberators. And so many of them were more than eager to assist the Nazis in identifying who the Jews were and pointing them out. So the men and boys would be rounded up, they'd be marched out to the outskirts of town, they'd usually be forced to dig their own graves, and the principal means of execution was a bullet to the back of the brain. Some cases, the individuals would be lined up and mowed down with machine gun fire. But we're talking about a real hands-on, bloody, and excessively violent form of execution. And so this is the first phase. Again, it begins almost immediately when the invasion of the Soviet Union begins. But what's really surprising here is those SS soldiers quickly acclimate to the process of killing. And you also have to re remember that none of these individuals were forced to engage in these activities. If an SS soldier was uncomfortable with the process, they could be transported to a different task. They weren't required to participate in those murders. But nonetheless, they acclimated quickly 
And as time continued, they're going to move from just targeting men and boys to the entire Jewish population. They're going to target infants. They're going to target the elderly. But the process of extermination is the same. Marching them to the outskirts of town, lining them up, and then essentially gunning them down in this really hands-on and really horrendous act of violence. And so as time continues, these operations are going to be expanded dramatically. And here we see some early efforts as they're targeting the men and boys. You see how the close and hands-on form of execution that we're talking about here. But as time continues, things are going to get ugly. Again, that's women and children are rounded up. The scale of operations is going to expand dramatically. And within really the first year of the Einsatz group in operation, uh, we're going to see literally hundreds of thousands of Jews and others murdered by these Einsatz group units. These uh, images are certainly some of the more disturbing things we see coming out of the hall. But just to give you one example of the Einsatz group in action, we can look at one of the events that takes place in the Ukraine. Einsatz group and unit goes into the major city there in Kiev. They round up the Jewish population. They march them out to a ravine on the outskirts of town that's called Bobby Yar. And that's what you see here in the image. Uh, and in two days, in September 1941, uh, one Einsatz group and unit is going to be responsible for murdering 33,000 people. So this is going to be two days. One example of one Einsatz group and unit in action. And these units are operating across Poland, Ukraine, Soviet Union through 1941, 1942. It gives you some indication of the scale of this tragedy. If we go back to something like the Civil War, you see battles that don't feature the same casualty rates as you're going to find in a place like Bobby Young. And so as we move forward in time from a Nazi perspective, things are working well. They've identified the solution to the racial question, which is mass extermination. And by the time we get on into 1942 or so, the Einsatz group of units have been responsible for murdering somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million people. And again, we're talking about this grisly hands-on form of execution. And of those 2 million people, approximately 1.3 million were Jews. It is important to note that the Einsatz group did not just target Jews. They also target other groups they considered to be undesirable. They uh, targeted Polish resistance, they targeted Red Army prisoners of war, and so again, total 2 million individuals targeted by the onset group killed. But despite the fact that from the Nazi perspective things are working well, there were some problems from their perspective with the onset group. One problem was simply efficiency. And if there's one thing that the Nazis were concerned about, it was being efficient. And as far as they're concerned, having to go out, travel across this vast area, track down all those individuals, and murder them was an expensive process. It required a lot of resources. It required a lot of manpower. And so from the, as far as the Nazis are concerned, we can do better. <clears throat> the other problem that the Nazis had is the impact this had on the soldiers that were involved. They're not overly concerned about the people that are being murdered. They're concerned about these SS soldiers. Because even though we're talking about some hardened SS warriors who are ardent Nazi followers, the idea of going out over the course of the day and murdering people systematically in close quarters is going to take a psychological toll on even the sternest supporter of the Nazi ideology. And so as a result, we start to see things like high rates of alcoholism, high suicide rates among the members of these Einsatz group and units. And so the Nazis believe that things are going well. We're progressing in our solution to the racial question. But we can do better and we can resolve the problems we're having. And this is going to set up the last and kind of final stage of the Holocaust, which is going to be addressed by Dr. Mack.
lead uh, my name is Lee Mackham, and I am a history instructor uh, here at Greenville Tech. And tonight I am going to be uh, talking about the Von Z Conference and the origins of the Final Solution. Now we've seen that anti-Semitism has been a rampant uh, fact in the Nazi regime ever since 1933 um, and in Germany before that. But despite this fact, can you hear me about there? Um, despite this fact, the Nazi leadership did not really develop a solution to what they termed the Jewish question or the Jewish problem until 1941-1942. Um, up until that time, as, as Justin mentioned, they had all these uh, different schemes, uh, one of which was resettlement. Uh, he mentioned the Madagascar scheme, which was to send Jews uh, to the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. That was probably going to be put off until after the war. But in 1941, the ideas of resettling Jews in another part of the world um, was put aside in favor of a new plan, as it later became called the final solution to the Jewish question. And this involved transporting Jews from Germany and the occupied territories to the east, uh, either to work camps, where they would literally be worked to death, or to death camps, like or Lika, or Sobobor, where they would be gassed. And the origins of the final solution lay in the German invasion of the Soviet Union, of Russia, in the summer of 1940. This was uh, called Operation Barbarossa. And as historians, we usually like to point out that Operation Barbarossa was uh, a, ter a tremendous failure in the end because Hitler was no student of history. If he had been a student of history, he would have learned from Napoleon that you don't want to get in Russia when it gets cold in, in later in the year. And that is true. Uh, uh, Operation Barbarossa in the end fails because of the Russian winter. But early on, it was a spectacular, spectacular success. Um, the German troops got to, you know, so close to Moscow, they could see uh, the spires on St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow. And so it looked like in the summer of 1941 that the Soviet Union was theirs, that the Soviet Union was about to collapse in, in front of them. And so it was in this euphoria in the summer of 1941, following the successes at the start of the Russian campaign, that the Nazi leadership began to make plans for the extermination of Europe's um, Jewish population. Um, Justin just talked about the Einsatzgruppen, uh, which followed the German army into uh, the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, these special units. And the Einsatzgruppen, as Justin mentioned, would go on to murder two million people, Jews, uh, Red Army uh, soldiers, other other people. But there was a feeling that this, this type of close hand-to-hand -hand type of murder that they were uh, perpetrating was having a psychological effect on these, uh, these soldiers, these, these troops in the Einsatz group. And this was especially felt by Heinrich Hitler. And so there was a, a feeling that a more efficient method needed to be devised. One that did not have the psychological effects of the Einsatz group. And two, that didn't you know, waste this precious ammunition. And so we know that sometime in 1941, uh, Hitler gave um, authorization to the final solution. Now, Hitler uh, was notorious for, uh, for not wanting to commit anything to paper. He liked to give verbal orders. Of course, you can deny those later, but he didn't like to commit anything to paper, and therefore we don't have any documentary evidence um, that you know, definitively links Hitler to the final solution, but we know that he gave the order um, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to carry this out. And the man who was given charge of carrying this out was the same one who had been given charge of organizing the Einsatz forces, and this was 
um, Reinhard Heidrich. Over Brooklyn Fuhrer, Reinhard Heidrich, that was his, his title, which is basically general. And he was given orders on July 31st, 1940, from Hermann Goering, Hitler's second in command, to come up with a total solution to the Jewish question. And so in the ensuing months, uh, Heydrich and his uh, people, his cronies, people like Adolf Eichmann, began to formulate this plan to transport the Jews to the East uh, for extermination. Um, on November 29th, he sends out invitations uh, to a meeting that is planned to take place on December the 9th uh, to discuss the final solution. So he sends out uh, invitations to a number of people. The meeting in the end uh, is postponed because of a couple of things. On December 5th, uh, the Red Army, the Soviet Army, uh, launches a counteroffensive against the Germans just outside of Moscow. And then two days later, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, which brings America to the war. So the Germans felt the need, or the Nazis felt the need, to sort of pull back and, and see how these events were going to play out. And so this meeting to talk about the final solution that had already been grown up was not held until January the 20th of 1942. And this meeting came to be known as the Bonzi Conference because of the location that it was held in this villa, the Bonzi Villa, um, which was owned by the SS uh, just outside of Berlin. And its address was 5658 Am Grazen Bonzi. And so they had the meeting here. And at this meeting on January 20th were 15 high-ranking Nazi officials. And it's interesting to note that of the 15, eight of these people who were here uh, held doctorates. So these were not, uh, these were very uh, highly educated people who came together to discuss this, this plan. Now we know about the proceedings of the Bonzi Conference because of notes that were taken by Adolf Eichmann at the, at the conference. And these notes were later compiled into a document, a memorandum, that was known as the Bonzi Protocol. And this protocol was then sent to all the people who had been at the meeting. And they had instructions to destroy all these copies <coughs> to make sure there wasn't a paper trail. Um, fortunately for us, one person was careless, uh, a guy named Martin Luther, who was a member of the German Foreign Office, uh, not to be confused with the 16th century uh, German theologian. Um, and he didn't destroy this copy. And so after the war, a copy of the Bonzi Protocol uh, was found in the Foreign Office files in Berlin. And we, so we know a lot from the, the Bonzi Protocol. We also know a lot from Adolf Eichmann and the testimony that he gave at his trial in Jerusalem in the 1960s. Um, Ed Eichmann, I don't have to <coughs> here, sorry, but Eichmann, uh, like you know, some, some Nazis, escaped at the end of the war to Argentina. He was hunted down by the Mossad, the Israeli Mossad, and brought back uh, to Israel to stand trial. And he was executed. But at his uh, trial in Jerusalem, he gave some more details about the conference. And we know that the meeting lasted about an hour and a half. It includes lunch and, according to Eichmann, copious amounts of alcohol were consumed. So this doesn't take long to, to discuss this, this plan. Um, at the meeting, Heydrich introduced a list of countries in Europe. And this list was divided into two parts, part A and part B. Part A were countries or areas that were controlled by Nazi Germany, occupied. Part B were countries that were not yet occupied by Nazi Germany. But of course, they had their plans. And out to the side are numbers. And these are the approximate um, Jewish population, populations of each of these areas. And if you notice, the grand total was 11 million. So they were setting their sights not on the six million that, that we know the figure that, that actually died, but they had their sights set on 11 million. And that's not to be confused with the figure of 11 million, that's the total figure that was killed, that includes non-Jews. So they had in, in their sights 11 million Jews uh, from all parts of Europe, Ireland, England, everywhere. 
and they talked a lot about how this process was to be carried out. I don't want to um, read you a, just a little bit from the, uh, the Bonzi Protocol document. Under proper guidance, in the course of the final solution, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labor in the East. Able-bodied Jews, separated according to sex, will be taken in large work columns to these areas for work on roads, in the course of which action, doubtless a large portion will be eliminated by natural causes. So he's saying that we're going to take uh, Jews to these work camps and work them relentlessly. And in the course of this, many are going to die from, from this. The possible final remnant will, since it will, be, well, since it will undoubtedly consist of the most resistant portion, have to be treated accordingly because it is the product of natural selection and would, if released, act as the seed of a new Jewish revival. So in other words, we want to make sure that anyone who is not killed by this overwork, who would definitely be very strong constitutionally, um, health-wise, we want to eliminate them so that they can't lead uh, a regeneration of the Jewish population. <laughs> in the course of the practical execution of the final solution, Europe will be combed through from west to east. The evacuated Jews will first be sent group by group to so-called transit ghettos, from which they will be transported to the east. So their plan was to take them from their homes to ghettos, which is like, like a, a transit camp. It's a temporary area, and, and from there they will be uh, taken by the cattle cars uh, to these uh, camps. Now, the word eliminated is about the strongest word in the Fonzi Protocol. So they use a lot of euphemisms. They don't come out and say kill or exterminate. But we can see, regardless of the euphemisms, what their plan was here in January of 1942. And that was the elimination of the Jews of Europe. Not 6 million, but 11 million, uh, if they could get their hands on that. Evidently, Heydrich coming into this meeting had some fears that he might meet some resistance from some of these officials. <clears throat> he was kind of afraid of that. But apparently he was overjoyed when he got to the meeting to find everyone there uh, in complete accord and in harmony about this plan. Um, and apparently Heydrich, who rarely drank, felt buoyed enough, felt buoyed enough uh, to allow himself glass of contact to celebrate the successful meeting. Now, the Vonsi uh, uh, conference was the first meeting that led to the promulgation of the final solution, but it was not the last. Uh, this was the highest ranking official, and they shared the knowledge with them. And then there were other meetings with lower level officials over the next couple of months. And so really by March, April of 1942 is when they start rolling out plan. And Mr. O'Brien is going to talk about that with the uh, death camps. Thank you.
And if I get all choked up, I apologize. <clears throat> the origins of the concentration camp system did not begin with the Nazis, but can be seen as early as the Spanish-American War in Cuba and the Boer War in South Africa at the turn of the century. Germany, prior to 1933, actually opposed the idea. Why give jobs to political dissidents and foreigners when Germans didn't even have jobs because of the Depression? However, in 1933, after the rise of the Nazi Party, political prisoners and dissidents were arrested and put into concentration camps. In 1933, after Hitler's ascension, roughly 2,600 prisoners were incarcerated at Dachau, the very first German concentration camp. There were really no rules, brutality reigned, and people died. However, there was not the overcrowding issues, lack of food, and harsh, hard labor that one would identify with the camps during World War II later. Yet the camps were brutal and still unconscionable. Sometimes the labor included digging holes, moving large stones and rocks, or heavy bags of sand across the camp for no reason at all, except to make sure that there were no idle hands. Between 1934 and 1937, a man by the name of Theodore Eicke was elevated, he's here on the left, was elevated uh, to administrator of the camp uh, by Heinrich Himmler, guy in the middle, we've seen his picture a number of times, and he established the temple for all the camps, including rules and regulations. Eicke hired all, out the laborers from these camps to help build roads and other camps. Harder labor seemed to coincide with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, and by the beginning of 1937, the death tolls rose for the first three months, 8 to 11 percent each month. Following the night of broken glass at the end of 1938, <clears throat> the SS used the event as a dry run for what was to come in World War II by arresting the 24,000 Jewish men immediately after Kristallnacht. <clears throat> the Nazis held them in camps, many of them until 1939. The brutality was heightened, the fear of the unknown caused hysteria for the prisoners, and the punishment was frequent and often. Many prisoners were eventually released back to their families, preceding the Blitz on Poland, only to find themselves back on trains relocated and even put back into the same camps. Oswald Pohl, who we saw a picture of here on the right, took over the camps in 1937, and by 1939 the camps were being built closer to resources. He decided that it would be a good idea that we had the laborers, let's move them closer to the resources so we could actually get something out of the laborers, not just moving rocks and sticks and sand across just to keep them busy. The idea that war couldn't kill a prisoner was not an issue. By 1939, there were only six camps in the Greater Reich. Dachau, Schaschenhausen, Buchenwald, Flossenburg, Mauthausen, and the Ravensbrücke. Ravensbrücke was the only female camp at that time. When the German army acquired Poland so quickly in World War II, as we heard uh, a few people mention, the land came with the largest Jewish population in Europe. It was also noteworthy to mention, as we have before again tonight, that the Soviet campaign that began in the Ukraine and into the Soviet lands also brought a larger Jewish population into the region. Because of these additions, the numbers of camps multiplied. Some suggested that there were 1,500 camps, while other sources put the number over 10,000. These dots are camps and or sub-camps of larger camps. So I'll show you this, and this is only really the Greater German Reich. But here are the larger camps that most people are familiar with. So I'll go back to this picture so you can see this again. And you can begin to understand that the camps were camp complexes with many smaller camps that usually surrounded, and they had different purposes and different reasons for being there. <clears throat> the SS used the rules, policies, and templates given by ICA in the 1930s that mutated and the mutated the brutality to create the camps from 1939 to 1941. A typical day in the camp. According to the compilation of numerous sources, 
of the survivors would go something like this. You receive a wake-up call at 4 a.m. It's by the capo. You must find your shoes. If you can't find them, if someone hasn't taken them. You may get beaten for not making your bed in the military fashion. You must rush out of the barracks to the sanitary facility and vie for a spot with the hundreds of other prisoners for a two-minute wash. Quickly, you may decide that you need to cut yourself in order to take the blood and rub it into your skin to make you look healthy. On the way back, you may even run to get the heart rate up and to get the blood pumping. You must race to the muster ground for roll call, inspection, and a strength report. Anybody not found, or anybody found wanting was removed. If you were late or you move at all, you were beaten. This could take several hours, but you would get a chance afterwards to eat breakfast. If you have your mess tin in hand, this is what you would get. It was approximately for an entire day's worth of food, about 1,200 calories. Anyone knows that anybody who has significant hard labor, you're probably burning three or 4,000 calories at least. So it wasn't near enough. The goal, again, was to kill them. You join the work team, be beaten, berated by soldiers as you leave the grounds for a 12 to 14 hour labor. You may or may not get a good tool or a tool at all. You may get beaten for not getting your work done. You do get a lunch break, which is a small amount of soup, maybe. If you faint or you complain, you will get beaten. Evening roll call at the Marshall Ground and prisoners line up in rows of 10. <clears throat> and this is where the SS will choose who to beat, who to shoot, or who to hang that evening. You must rush to stand in line for dinner, which is soup again. You finally return to the barracks to meet the block leader, who will make you probably exercise, he may beat you, and you are not allowed to leave. On any given day, you may go into what is called the muzzle man state, a state that is caused by severe exhaustion, and in one way or another, whether it's you just simply not moving, or your body collapsing, or the fact that you don't move and you get shot for not moving, led to death. This was now permanent incarceration with little to no hope. Day in and day out, you witness more cursing, more beating, more abuse, uncertainty, and less food. If you got hurt, it was surely a death sentence. It was annihilation by work. Someone had mentioned the number of companies that are still around today. How about IG Farber? Subsidiaries of IBM, several rocket propellant, coal mines, airplane factories, all were in these camps, hard labor camps, caused for the war effort, and this was the economic side allowed to continue. Also a darker side were the experiments that often occurred at the camps. They were cruel and unusual. They included testing pain tolerance, pressurization experiments on the body till they imploded or exploded, radiation experiments until the bodies burned, and many other heinous acts. By 1941, the Germans began trying alternate ways to kill prisoners, as we talked before. Killing by the camps and the Einsatz group and bullets were just really inefficient. So they decided on the final solution, this Jewish question, and it included a decree to construct six new extermination camps, mainly in the region of Poland, where most of the Jewish population was concentrated. It was along the rail lines for easier transport of prisoners into these death centers, and it was in remote rural areas so they could be out of sight as possible. There was Kelmo, Treblinka, Delzik, Sorobor, and Majinek, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. Most people know about Auschwitz-Birkenau because it was probably one of the more brutal places to be. Jewish ghettos had been burned as early as 1941, and the Nazis expelled any and all Jews from the Greater Reich by train and marches, moving the prisoners towards these new extermination camps. In fact, as stated before, transit camps became very popular and very important. 
You had to be able to move Jews quickly into these camps and then move them to the extermination camps in a fast fashion in order to kill as many as possible. Many times the prisoners were confined in cattle cars with little to no fresh air, rising heat, no water or food, and they may have to sit for extended hours. Many of them died inside these cars. Also many died en route. The goal was to kill 11 million prisoners across Europe. The seemingly most efficient way to kill prisoners was gas chambers or the like. These death camps were like industrial factories. This is Auschwitz-Birkenau. It looks very much like an industry, doesn't it? The underground crematorium was uh, a little above, so underneath were the gas chambers. And then you had the above crematoriums, and the bodies were gassed under the ground, and then workers, typically prisoners, placed the bodies that were dead onto elevators, raised them up inside, and then someone would drag those off the elevators and put them into the ovens to burn the bodies. This must have been an exceptionally grisly and gut-wrenching job. In these death camps alone, Sorbor saw the fewest of deaths, 250,000. Kelno used gas and trucks pumping carbon monoxide to kill prisoners. Just using carbon monoxide, they killed 150,000 prisoners. Belzec only ran for about a year, a little over a year, and they killed some 600,000 prisoners. Treblinka taught 900,000 deaths before it was shut down in 1943. Magnik. Six concrete gas chambers killed 2,000 simultaneously and 1.5 million dead. In Auschwitz-Birkenau, there were only four gas chambers, but they managed to kill one to two million people at this camp. In one of the concrete gas chambers, on the floor was a word written in blue chalk, and it said Vergast which literally means gassed out. Somebody who was being gassed took blue chalk in there to write it down on the floor to let the people know that coming in what was gonna happen and what had happened to them. Similar stories are told where claw marks were on the walls as they tried to scrape their way out to any vent in the air. These camps evolved during 1933 to 1945, but the end result never changed, but became clear as time progressed. Some got out. Um, we're going to be hearing from one um, on Thursday night that Ms. Pretty Heller left after the Bristol night. I think that uh, I know that, and I don't know a huge amount about this, but I know that there's uh, a lot of groups, are, um, groups of Jews that got out and went to Palestine, Israel. Um, I think that you know, with America, it was um, you know getting uh, in there. Uh, that was the problem. Um, getting in here. So yes, I, mean, I think that there were some. I think that a lot, of course, were probably weren't able to get out because of economic circumstances. Um, you know, it, those that had that had finances, um, you know, might have been able to. Those that, that weren't able to, to book passage were assigned to. Yeah. To get out, you had to have somebody who's willing to support you. 
So I did talk to a man that's father got out because he got out before and came over to America and arranged to have someone financially say they can support him, the family. But I tell my students, some did get out, but if, if the American government said today they're going to kill you if you're in South Carolina, where would you go? Where would you go? Go you to your family in North Carolina or Georgia or Tennessee? That wasn't far enough. I was going to say also, uh, what was typical was that the family would get somewhere and the mother and daughter might be able to go, but the man was forced left behind. And I was reading in my research that there was an entire campaign before everything kind of got underway of train loads of children. That were, they were trying to get to the coastline, get them on a ship and get them out while the parents stayed behind. So yeah, there were people who got out uh, just in different ways. That was called the kinder transport. Literally put their children on a train, sent them to London for one part, which meant they had no ship. But some of those children never got, never got back to their families. Yes, sir. This why I'm here to explain that wonderful immigration law suddenly popped up and now going out the window. Just a minute to you. There was one main law. Would you repeat the question? Explain our immigration laws at that point. Well, the United States basically shut their doors because they were afraid the German spies would be in the country. The Senate can study the study. I think the good Lord let us so we call the soul and call the government to Mexico and the wild. Yeah, I can't specifically address the laws. I know after World War One is when we really began to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, um, I'm a history instructor. I some early. Um, the immigration quota started in the 1920s. They capped the limits on which countries could immigrate, um, and you could transfer it. So if Germany had 50. And England had 100, and Germany had used all 100, and England still had a bunch left over. You could transfer one to the other. Um, most of anti Semitism was rampant in the United States. The most popular figure on the radio uh, spoke out of it. Anti Semitism had about 40 million people per week. More people turned into him than FDR's fireside chats. Uh, FDR tried to hold a conference, and it was the Evian Conference in 1936, no, 38, sorry. And um, in France, uh, which to discuss the refugee crisis and what they were supposed to do. There was a gentleman's agreement between the United States and the British that the British would bring up that we wouldn't do anything about our immigration quotas as long as the Americans didn't bring up Palestine as a possible um, area for occupation. <coughs> All right. um, even Australia said we didn't have a racial problem, we weren't about to import one. A uh, lot of American countries were much more willing to accept Jewish refugees. Uh, only they need to be farmers, but due to European laws, none of them were. Uh, the Dominicans were, the Dominican Republic was actually quite open to accept Jews, um, but they had a huge problem where they had just massacred a bunch of Haitian refugees, so they weren't too keen on sort of shipping them um, that direction. Uh, Hitler, when he heard about the Evian Conference, he said, if you guys don't think you have enough Jews in your country, feel free to take some of ours. He even set a ship around called the SS St. Louis. Uh, to dock in Havana, giving them all uh, uh, essentially tourist visas. They all had quota numbers to the United States. They were just waiting to get called. They were never allowed to disappear from Havana. Uh, they were there for nearly a month. And then they sailed up the coast, hoping that the United States would feel bad that you have almost 1,000 Jews on this ocean liner. Uh, and the United States sent out the National Guard to make sure no one jumped overboard to sail to the swim to the coastline. Uh, and brought it back so it showed Hitler carte blanche that nobody cared about the Jews so he could do whatever he wanted. Uh, more than half of those who returned to Europe uh, were in occupied areas uh, when the Nazis took over and half of those died in concentration camps. Um, so it was a widespread issue and immigration laws don't change until after the fact. So what grade do we do in America? I mean lots of people are culpable for what now. Yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> but it's a widespread idea that as he discussed. Yeah, we got an F. Yeah, but FDR, um, most of his cabinet was anti-Semitic. Um, FDR himself really um, 
did try, but his hands were tied on the fact that no one really wanted to import it. We have people like Father McLaughlin speaking on the radio about how horrible Jews are. They actually, the Germans actually sent um, foreign um, ambassadors and administrators to the United States to decide which areas were most open to German policies. They determined the Northeast was bad because of large Jewish populations, but out west they were more accepting uh, to um, German policies on anti-Semitism that if you sort of targeted those areas, um, that they wouldn't say anything about that. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, I'd just like to add to that. It wasn't just immigration laws that, that would not allow Jews from the St. Louis to land, to disembark in the United States. I would have to say it was the anti-Semites in the State Department, the U.S. State Department, and it, apparently some of them are still there. I don't mean them, in, you know, uh, the same people, but I mean people similar to them. The fact is they knew about the concentration camps at some point during World War II, and the Americans and the British absolutely refused to bomb them because they were afraid, perhaps, maybe they were afraid that American lives would be lost in that, but they felt that they had more strategic targets. And so they let the, the concentration camps continue to exist, and it probably only encouraged the Germans, when they, the Nazis, when they were made aware that the whole world didn't really care about the Jews. So, you know, why should they, um, you know, refrain from continuing their policy? So I think it was more than just immigration laws. It's probably because there were people who just refused to accept the fact that Jews were human beings. We need you on stage. Um, I, I want to add something to that. And, and I, I totally support your, you know, your idea about it being targeted, the Jewish population being targeted. But we need to remember, though, that during this time frame that we're looking at, the turn of the 20th century, all up into the late 1920s and early 1930s, the United States itself, going back to my presentation, I want you guys to understand, we were leading the charge in the eugenics movement. The United States was very culpable in the development of eugenic philosophy. A lot of high profile businessmen, including J.D. Rockefeller, sponsored eugenics clinics, and it wasn't just the Jewish population that was targeted. It was anyone who was deemed to be ethnically inferior. This included anyone who was Slavic, anyone from Eastern Europe. This included the Irish, because even during this time we were talking about the Irish was considered to be genetically inferior. So the United States essentially was having an identity crisis, a serious identity crisis during this time frame. And we were looking at anyone who we consider to be other to not allow them entry into the United States. So it wasn't just one population. It was many, many, many different populations. And that is what resulted in the 1924 National Origins Act that limited the amount of people who were able to come in from different European countries. You had a question. How many Jews fought in World War I for the German army? Uh -huh. A bunch. And we had so, generals, we had men with, that had earned awards. Exactly. So why did, they, did later they, uh, the consensus become that, they were, that the Jews had stabbed them in the back? And, Chin. Yeah, and caused... One of the many, many problems with the unhappiness and misery of the German people after World War I. Just to address the whole stab in the, the back then, um, in the World War I, uh, you know, Germany signs the Treaty of Versailles. But you've got to keep in mind that no foreign soldiers had even stepped foot on German soil at that point. So that led a lot of Nazis to believe that we weren't really defeating them fairly, that we were stabbed in the back socialists and Democrats and Jews in the government. And there, in the Weimar Republic, there were prominent Jews, Jewish politicians, and there were some prominent Jews in the economy, the bankers and others, kind of basically being able to target, target a handful of individuals and lay all the blame at their feet. And I was going to say, and let me add just one thing to that, and I'll be brief about it, but it's probably a good idea the German people during World War I were told they were winning. Even if they were losing, they were still told they were winning. And so they believed 
wholeheartedly that they were winning, and all of a sudden when the news came that they had lost, what do you do? Surrender. <clears throat> yeah, and they said, well, and of course this idea of the scapegoat. You also have to remember too, psychologically, after Versailles, you had to find a common enemy, someone to blame. And so beyond the fact that you had to stab in the back, you had to find this common enemy that you were going to galvanize this movement. It was a romantic movement that borrowed itself from the 1800s and galvanized the, the population, and we see the fruits of that in 1933. And another oh. Mr. Woodson? Uh, I'm reading from NPR.org just from last week. Uh, they did a story about North Carolina. Between 1929 and 1976, 7,000 poor, many poor, many African American, many disabled were sterilized in one of the country's most aggressive eugenics programs. 1976. 1976. And actually, it didn't stop in 76. And they, they, the people trying to prove that they were victims of this just a few miles away from here can't because for some reason the doctors didn't keep good paperwork. That is correct. And even the Department of Social Services in North Carolina would sign off for a lot of the elderly for, um, to women who were undergoing a change of life as well as young girls to be sterilized. Um, and a lot of times they were taken in to undergo very generic procedures such as having a tonsillectomy done and in fact during the procedure they would be they would be sterilized involuntarily. That's here. What else? Other questions? And just to make a connection there, you had asked Jews served in the military, how could they later be blamed for this? But African Americans fought the revolution and then stop this from justifying their Easy to And another thing, in terms of, and we haven't really mentioned here tonight, but in terms of the stab in the back um, kind of theory, if there was anything that came close to Jews in terms of Hitler and Nazis' hatred, it was communists. And so he liked to make a correlation with uh, Karl Marx, the founder of communism. Uh, he had been born a Jew. Um, and so he liked to tie, Hitler liked to make that connection. Hands? Questions? Yes. What actions took place to get German, Germany to be who it is today in such a demonized way they were after World War II? They seem to have risen from the Marshall Who was that? The Marshall Plan. Yeah. All the money comes We actually learned a lesson in World War I that you don't let a country just destroy and fall apart. You pump it up. We put money into it. We build it up. We also separated it. So we actually financially built Germany back up. So another leader like Hitler couldn't come in and say, you know, they're starving to death. Follow me. Now we we helped them. It's called the Marshall Plan. We invested money on the west side. <laughs> Until the wall came down, which was 50 years ago, 25, 25 years ago, Sunday night. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting that over right now. Yes. But now we have that situation. What is this? That country. What is it? Syria, Iraq, and all this. And now we have a similar situation where we didn't learn a lesson where we're supposed to or should. Clark says they're not parallel. There was a stable government there until we went in. There was a stable government until we went in. You're talking, you're talking about Iraq or Syria? Either, well, Iraq had a stable government until Lord Bush went out and turned the African part upside down and went back. And uh, we're still cleaning up that mess.
we get back to the whole house. Yes. No, that's good. Thank you. All right. Aren't they great? These guys. You don't have any hours. Have a Holocaust Day, remember, say April 22nd. That's what I wanted. And I walked into a meeting with this, these guys and they said, Let's do a week. I'm like, okay, let's do a week. So thank you for coming. Thank them for their great education and sharing it with you. And thank our sponsors again.